The apostles' mindset was being molded for the work that they would do after Jesus' departure and ascension back to heaven. They were not completely there at this point. They were concerned about who would be leaders in the kingdom that they mistakenly thought was an a earthly one or a worldly one. They were given a wonderful lesson from the Savior here in the passage that we was just read about being humble, about understanding that to be a great leader, one must be a servant. Many times we may think that being in the forefront is how we are to live in this world. I had a district manager when I was still in my former retail career, and we were setting up a new store, and there's obviously a lot of work that has to be done in that. And so the district manager had decided to visit on a particular day to see the progress and how the store was coming along, if there were issues that needed to be addressed, or if everything was on schedule and the store would, would open on time. And he came in and we were at a point where we were about to go to lunch. And on setups, it's not like when a store is open and you have customers all the time. Everyone breaks at the same time and everyone comes back at the same time for the most productivity uh, to be had. Well, the district manager arrived just about the time we were going to lunch, and the store manager, my, my immediate supervisor, saw him and thought, oh, oh, great, I'm not going to be able to go to lunch. And the DM said, he said, you guys, I know it's your lunch time. You go to lunch. He said, I'm going to do some paperwork, and I'll, I'll see you when you get back. Well, when we got back, here was our district manager pushing a dust mop through the store. And our boss, my boss was like, oh no, he, he, we should have done that before we left. And he, so he goes up to him and, and he, you know, I, w I was walking along and the district manager said, look, I don't mind doing this. If I ever get to the point where I think this is beneath me, then I'm not being a good leader. Now that really stuck with me throughout the rest of my retail career. Don't ever think you're too good to do something that needs to be done. This type of servant leadership, even though this particular district manager didn't know it, that was the model of leadership that Jesus is talking about. Be a servant to those that you want to lead. And I, I believe that if we'll do that, if we'll become and have the mindset of a servant as Christians, more people will be led to Christ in the way that they should be. We should not lord it over them, those who are not Christians, and make them feel inferior because I'm a Christian and, well, you're not. Christ did not do that. He was the Son of God. And yet he, we don't see him throughout the gospel accounts lording that over them, even though he had the absolute authority and right to do that. Here in Matthew, we see where he says, I did not come to be served, but to serve. There's a passage in Mark that's very similar in Mark 10 and verse 45. We need to have this mindset that Jesus had. As we sang a moment ago, we need to talk to God in, in prayer, and we, we need to study his word and allow God's word to make us a servant, to mold us. Remember the words of the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8, the prophet said, But now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. We need to be molded. 
we need to remember also the words from the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. We are not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. There's those English words we need to look at, and something's being formed. Either we are being formed and molded into the image of the world, or we are being transformed or molded in the image of Christ. There's only two choices. And when we understand, we get that God wants us to be a servant and not ask to be served, but to see what we can do for others. Those who are of the household of faith, certainly. There are many passages that speak of one another, how we are to act among one another. But there are also many passages that we are to serve others. Let's begin. I've entitled the lesson, The Humble Mind of a Servant. And we're going to look at how Jesus had this mindset. And then we're going to look at how the apostles learned and developed this mindset. They did not have it in the text that we just read. They did not have the mindset of a servant. Two of them, in fact, came to Jesus and, and had their mother say, I want these two to be leaders. And one, one on your right and one on your left. Now they recognized Jesus for who he was. The master, the, set, the leader, the teacher. But they wanted to be right there with him. But Jesus says, no, you don't understand what you're asking. They didn't get it at that point, but later they would understand it fully. And we'll look at that in a moment. Let's begin looking at the mindset of Jesus. We see what Jesus said, that he came not to be served, but to serve. So let's look at a little more detail. What did Jesus teach? What is it that Jesus taught? First in John 5, you'll see that all three of these scriptures are from the, the Gospel of John. Listen to the words of Christ. We'll read all three of these before we make any comments on them. Listen carefully to what Jesus taught. First in chapter 5 and verse 30, I can do nothing on my own initiative, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Then again in John 7, verse, beginning in verse 16. So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true. And there is no unrighteousness in him. And then in John 14, beginning in verse 8, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. The teaching of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus shows us who we are to submit to who we are to be humble to. And that's the God of heaven, the Father of all. We have to remember again who Jesus was, but he wanted them to understand that God is over all. Now, yes, we'd later Jesus would be given all authority in heaven on earth, Matthew 28, 18. We understand that. And he reigns today from the right hand of, at the right hand of God. But Jesus wants us to put our focus on God. I've said before, and I, th I think it, it bears repeating, our lives need to be God-focused, Christ-centered, and Holy Spirit-directed through His Holy Word. And when we have that mindset, we are going to be servants to others. Because Jesus was a servant to others. 
Now, Jesus taught many more things, as in, in this passage we read, read a moment ago, and, and many other places about being humble and what being humble means. But he, I want to look at these three things specifically to show we, it's not, when, when we are being servants, we're not giving ourselves the glory. We're not saying, I say, or this is what I think, or this is what I believe. We're saying, this is what the Bible teaches. This is what God has taught us to know and to do. And Jesus said, it's not my own words that I'm giving you. It's from the Father. He wanted them to know where the authority lied. And it, and it, it was at God, with God. And we must recognize that also. So that's what he taught. What did he do? Acts 10 and verse 38, as Peter is preaching to the household of Cornelius, he says, You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We do not have the same power that Jesus has, and that's understandable. We're not supposed to have that same power. But that little phrase... He went about doing good. That's what Christians should be known as. Those who go about doing good. And I've suggested before, and I, I want to suggest again, the greatest good we can do someone is to teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Is to show them how that gospel has transformed our lives into something that God is pleased with. And no, we're not perfect at it, but we're striving to be that complete, mature Christian that God wants us to be. In John, the 13th chapter, this may be what comes to mind. When you think of Jesus being humble, what he did here, and there's some, some, some significance that I want you to, to grasp as we continue to study this idea of being a humble, having the humble mind of a servant. First, in verses 3 through 5 of John 13, the Bible says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, Jesus never, ever lost sight of who he was and where he came from. Certainly did not. But look what he, because it says knowing this, I think it's significant that John tells us this. Jesus knew who he was and he knew where he came from, but look what he does next. He got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. And we may not think much of that. We may think, well, he didn't want to get his clothes dirty. We don't think much of that. But this is exactly what a servant who was about to perform what Jesus was about to perform would do. And so before he even begins, the apostles' mouths had to be dropping. It's like, what is he doing? We're not told. The text doesn't tell us their, their immediate reaction. But I, I can just imagine them looking at him like, what? what is he doing? Why is he taking off his outer cloak? Why is he putting a towel around himself? And then they find out. There in verse 5, the Bible says, He poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And then we're going to skip the rest of the account for time's sake. But, but we remember how Peter says, well, wash all of me. You know, he says, if you don't let me wash your feet, I don't want you to wash my feet, Lord. But and Jesus says, well, I have to. You don't have a part of me. Well, then wash all of me. He said, no. You just need your feet washed. The rest of you is clean. But then in verse 13, we pick it back up. He says, you call me teacher and Lord. And you are right, for so I am. Now listen to the lesson he gives them here. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I do, as I did to you, rather. You should do as I did to you. Do you think this lesson kind of came home to those two who wanted to be great? They called him Lord and teacher. Yet Jesus girded himself 
and wash their feet. In Philippians 2, 5 to 8, Paul tells us this about what Jesus did. He says, have this attitude, this mindset in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be held on to, to not let go of, verse 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That passage speaks to me every day, and I hope it does to you also. Jesus was where I hope every one of you want to be someday. He was in the presence of God in heaven itself. And it says he did not regard that as something he was going to keep hold of. In other words, he did not deny or defy the Father when God sent him to the earth. Jesus knew all along what the plan was. He knew all along before the beginning of, of the world that he was going to be sent, that he was going to be born from a woman, and that he was going to live his life as a man, as a human. And he did not regard that as, as something that he was going to deny or defy, but he did it willingly, humbly, obeying the Father. Remember the words he said? I don't speak on my own initiative. I don't do my own will, but the will of the Father, the one who sent me. So what was the result? It's what he did, because that's what he taught. And what was the result? Well, look at verses 9 and 10 of Philippians 2. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth and then in Colossians he is also the head of the body of the church and he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything preeminence as one translation uses. First place in everything. Humbled himself, became the servant that he calls us to be, and the result was God exalted him. Jesus did not have to exalt himself. He did not have to glorify himself, but that was the Father who would do that. What a lesson for us. What a lesson for us. Next, the apostles. As we already noted, they did not have the right mindset in our passage from Matthew chapter 20. They didn't understand what was going to happen. They didn't understand exactly what was going on with Jesus. But later, they did. And so they taught the same concept, the idea that Jesus had taught them. In Romans 12 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul writes, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. We may look at that English rendition and say, Don't associate with the lowly. What does that mean? Or, or associate with the lowly, rather. What does that mean? Well, it's the same word that in other places is translated humble. Associate with those who are humble and are of the same mind, those who are not prideful, those who are not high and mighty in their, in their actions and in their thoughts and in their attitude. You associate with those who are humble. Be humble yourself and associate with those that are. The more you associate with those who are like-minded, those that the one another entails, then it's easier for you to live that life on this earth. The more you associate with those who are not, the easier it becomes not to serve as you should. Not to have the right mindset that you should have 
in order to be pleasing to God. In Colossians, the third chapter, beginning in verse 12, the Bible says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. You want to get along as Christians? Do you want to get along with other people? Put on a heart that allows that to happen. When we put on the, the, the things of this world and we take on the things of this world, it's not taking on these things. It's not putting on into your minds, into your heart, the right attitude, but one of compassion, one that sees things from the other's perspective and doesn't make quick, rash judgments, but, but decides things in, in the right way and in the right time. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord... Let's pause there for a minute. We're going to note this again in a moment, but I want you to understand how Paul humbles himself in his writing here. He doesn't say, I implore you as an apostle because I have the right to do that as an apostle. He says, I implore you as a prisoner of the Lord. In many of our minds, I would, I would think that most of you think of prisoners maybe a little differently than you do other people. And that's okay. I get that. They did something to be placed there, to be put there, the majority of them. And certainly I understand that. But we have to understand why Paul uses this particular... Why didn't he say that he was an apostle? I implore you as an apostle of Christ because I have the right to do that. No. He came from a, a, a state, a, an idea of humbleness. And he says, I implore you as a prisoner of the Lord, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of of the calling with which you have been called. How do we do that, Paul? He says, with all humility, in the next verse, all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love. If we're doing that, isn't that the very idea of serving someone? Not waiting for them to serve you, but serving them in love and in gentleness and patience. Humbling yourself to that point where you don't think it's beneath you to help that person. To serve them. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 5. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility. Toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Do you remember Jesus girded himself? The idea that Peter portrays here in the original Greek language when he says clothe yourself with humility. This word is not found any other place in the New Testament. Suggesting that Peter had that incident in John 13 on his mind when he wrote this. Because this Greek word indicates something that a servant would do, put on an apron to do their job. He Clothe yourself with humility. You put on the clothes of a servant. You understand that you are a servant of God, of Christ, and you're to serve others. God is the one who exalts. 
According to Philippians 2, he exalted Christ. God exalted Christ. He will exalt us. He will exalt the apostles. The apostles did not need to exalt themselves. That's what they taught, what they did. Look at 2 Peter 1. What? Again, I want to bring this out. How, why would they write it this way? Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Why did he not say apostle? Isn't apostle a nice title? Isn't that something that was important to Peter? No. The most important thing is the thing in the Greek writings, the most important thing was always what they put first. Always. And so he says, I'm a bondservant. By the way, I'm an apostle. But I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus took on the form of a bondservant when he came to this earth. He took on that role. What it, why is it translated as bondservant? The word doulos means just that. You're bound to the one that you serve. You're bound to your master. You will do your master's will, and your will is no longer important at all. You are the clay, and he is the potter. When you take on that mindset, that humbleness. 1 Peter 5.1 Listen to this again. Because I think it's significant. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. What was most important to him? Not that he witnessed the sufferings of Christ, but the first thing he mentions as your fellow elder. Now, it doesn't mean that he was an elder above elders. That's not what it's saying. He's like, I understand what you're going through. I understand it because I'm an elder also. I'm, I'm your fellow elder. I'm not just an apostle. I, or, or you, you shouldn't look at me and exalt me. What did he do when Cornelius came to him? He, he said, you don't worship me. I'm just a man like you. Couldn't he have said at that point to Cornelius, yeah, you, you need to worship me because I'm an apostle. I was there when Christ was, was killed. I was there. I walked with him for three years. I'm important. No, you stand up because I'm just a man. The apostles did what they taught. They, they taught humility and they practiced that humility. Paul did the same thing in Philippians 1.1. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus. I want you to know who I am. In the book of Philemon, verses 8 through 10, listen to him. Again, he could call upon his apostleship, but he does not. Once again, he, he uses the same type of attitude. Therefore, I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet, listen to him, put on a, a heart of compassion and tie all that up in love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And then in Philemon, he practices that, yet for love's sake. I rather appeal to you, since I am such a person as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. Look at the humbleness of Paul. I'm just an old man. I'm Paul, the old man, and I'm a prisoner of Christ, and I'm appealing to you for love's sake that you take Onesimus back. So what was the result? What was the result of what they taught and what they did? 1 Peter 5, 12. This may seem a little odd, this passage, but Peter doesn't have a passage like Paul does. But I think it's we can infer from it what he meant. He says these words, Through Silvanus, our faithful brother, for so I regard him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. And I think in those words... Peter exhorting other Christians to do this was because that's what Peter did. And that's what he believed in. And that's what he wanted them to believe in. I've exhorted you. I've told you to be humble. I've told you that God will exalt you. I want you to stand in the grace of God. I want you to stand firm in that. 
And then the passage where I hopefully you are familiar with, 2 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 7. Paul said, that, here's the result. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. That's verse 6. Verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will, will award to me on that day. I think that's another way of saying I will be exalted by the Lord. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. When you love the appearing of Christ and you understand what it all entails, then you're going to be feel compelled, compelled to be obedient to that message. So what about us today? What about Christians today? What are we to do? We are to follow the example that Christ had. We are to follow the example that the apostles had. The apostles taught what Jesus wanted them to teach. Remember when Jesus sent them out in Matthew 28, he said, you teach them all that I have commanded you. You teach them all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. And they did just that. I want to sum up what we are to do in this passage. John 12, 25 to 26. Listen to the words of Christ. He who loves this life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Do you see how the pattern doesn't change? God highly exalted Christ. He exalted the apostles at the proper time. Peter says that if you humble yourselves, he will exalt you. And here Jesus says, if you serve me and follow me, the Father will honor you. We must have the humble mind of a servant. In this passage, Jesus tells us clearly, life eternal awaits us. But we've got to give up our own will and adopt the mindset of a servant. We've got to clothe ourselves with humility. As Jesus girded himself with that towel to be a servant, we must gird ourselves with humility and, and humbleness as we approach others about Christ. The humble mind of a servant, Jesus taught and he practiced it. The apostles learned and developed the things that Jesus taught, and then they taught and practiced it. We must also learn what Jesus taught, what the apostles taught, because of what Christ wanted them to teach. And we must develop that in our lives, and then we must teach and practice it as well. Today, if you're here and you have not adopted the humble mind of a servant and become a child of God, that's a requirement that you, cannot, that you cannot deny or defy if you want to be pleasing to God. And if you are a Christian and you're struggling with this, we're, we stand ready to help you, to pray with you and for you. Whatever your need is, please come now and say to God, Make me a servant. Say to God, yes, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after your will. Come now while we stand and sing.